I'm starting a new series today. I've been on the last one for, I think I was on it for 10 weeks, and uh, that was all summer long, so we got something fresh today. And I'm going to call this Transformation, and it's going to be Transformation on a number of levels. How many know God, when Jesus comes to your life, He changes you? Let me say last Thursday was uh, September 12th, and September 12th, I uh, know, 43 years ago, it was 1976 at 7.20 in the evening, I had a fresh experience with God that revolutionized and changed my life as a 17-year-old, soon to be the next month, 18-year-old, and Jesus transformed my life. I was, in my own mind, the black sheep of my family, did all the wrong things with too many of the wrong people for too long, and, and just had a real poor attitude about me and life and what my future looked like, and uh, but gee, how many know when Jesus comes in, he lifts a veil and he lets you see how you really are. And when you see how you really are, he enables, he allows you to fall at his feet and say, if you'll just, if you'll just trust me with your life, I can do a lot better than you ever will. And he did that for me. And so it's transformation. So uh, we'll call this series transformation. It'll take a while to get through this and uh, <clears throat> transformation on a number of levels. How many know there's personal life transformation that happens when you make Jesus Lord. And we don't want to go into detail and talk about what that looks like. It's process. And uh, it's an instantaneous thing. And then also it's process at the same time. So uh, we, uh, we're we going to talk about uh, uh, transformation in family and marriage. Today we're going to talk about national transformation. How many know there's hope and help for America? You may feel like, man, what in the world's going on in the country that I used to know? It's nothing like it used to be. Well, God wants to transform. How many believe that? And we're going to find out today God wants to use us as those that help with the transformation. So how can we overcome our personal problems? How can we change as a nation as we go through these perplexing times? Well, Jesus has put the answer in our hands, so uh, transformation is possible. I want to talk about that. And uh, Jesus revealed a truth to a, a man that came to him at night one night. So in John chapter 3, you may want to turn in your Bible, and we'll have the scripture right behind me. As well, and I want to read this passage because uh, th this is really this is really the beginning of transformation. J uh, John three, uh, verse one. Just get right on into it. There was a man named Nicodemus. Everybody say Nicodemus. Now I was just inspired. I happened to look his name up, and you know what his name means? It means victory for the people. That's what Nicodemus means. So it's really unusual to me as I started looking this like, here's the guy, his name means victory for the people. And, and, and Jesus, you know, may have known what his name meant and, and, and thought, well, you know, he's the representative person for the culture that we're dealing with right now. And perhaps for all time, there was a man named Nicodemus. So Nicodemus is sort of like me and you. He's got challenges. He's got questions. He wants solutions. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. There's a lot right there. Nicodemus was a Jewish religious leader, and then he was a Pharisee. Now, Jesus was a politician, number one. Um, Nicodemus was not Jesus. Nicodemus was a... I know, I got it right. Yeah. <laughs> Nicodemus was a politician because he was a Jewish religious leader, and he was part of this group of people called the Sanhedrin. Everybody say Sanhedrin. That was a Jewish... Uh, that was a group... Jewish leadership group in Jesus' day. It, it, uh, it was around for a long time, and it consisted of 70 men. They were mostly rabbis. They were scholars in various ways, and they came from various. They were Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes. They didn't have electronic means of reading the Bible. It had to be all written by hand, so they had people called scribes that were a part of this group. There were 70 men, and they were responsible. The the Sanhedrin were responsible for the spiritual life and the civic life of the Jewish race in, in Israel that were under the tutelage of the Roman Empire. How many understand? So the Roman Empire allowed the Jews kind of to, to be self-governed in some way when they, within their empire. And they allowed this group, the Sanhedrin, uh, to oversee the Jewish people. So, so if people had a, a civic matter, one person had a claim against another, or there was a death and you want to know if someone killed someone, will you go to the Sanhedrin? So I'm just saying that the Sanhedrin carried a lot of weight. And a person that was a member of the Sanhedrin, they were highly esteemed, highly looked up to. I mean, they, they, were, they were the big dogs that were walking around and everybody kind of like, 
knew that when they came around, they had a lot of authority and they carried weight with respect to how, reli- how religious life was lived in Israel as well as how civic life was conducted. So when you saw a, a person of the Sanhedrin, that's a really big deal. A huge politician of his day, Nicodemus was. So it says a Jewish religious leader. And then it says he was a Pharisee. Now the Pharisees were an unusual group of people. You know, God gave us the Old Testament. They did not have the New Testament in Jesus' day. And um, uh, the Pharisee, and, and so God gave, God gave ten, ten commands to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. And these ten commands just cover some basic things about how to live life in a fallen world. You're a fallen person. You have yearnings you don't want. You have desires you don't care for. But there you are. And these Ten Commandments provide a platform or a basis for living life. This is how you get along with people who are fallen, people who are sinful. So God gave uh, Moses the Ten Commandments. And so that was in vogue. But the Pharisees, over a period of time, they added to the Ten Commandments And the Jews had all kinds of books called the Talmud, and they're made of all kinds of writings from centuries of time where people interpreted the law of God, uh, where the Jews, the, the, um, the scholarly Jews interpreted God's laws, and they had hundreds of laws that they added to the Ten Commandments. So you didn't have ten, and most of us can't keep the ten. And so they added, y'all, hundreds. So again, so when you see... When you see a Pharisee walking down the street in Jesus' day, uh, here's the guy, he's dressed to perfection, he does everything just right, and he's always looking around, he's like, let me see if you're dressed right, let me see if you're doing right, let me see if you're, if you're doing every dot, crossing every T and dotting every I and doing everything you're supposed to do, and, and everybody knew when they saw a Pharisee, they looking, he's looking at me. He's checking me out. He's wanting to see if I'm, if I'm really, really spiritual, if I really obey the law. Well, the Pharisees' law was too much. And Jesus had his uh, strongest condemnation to Pharisees, if you read the New Testament, because they were stinking hypocrites. They were expecting everybody else to obey these hundreds of laws that they set up, and they couldn't do it themselves. And so when he came down the street, it's like, man, that's, there's a Pharisee, there's a Sanhedrin guy. So people had a lot of attitudes towards, towards people like Nicodemus, one of the Sanhedrin. He was a Pharisee. So um, verse 2 says, after dark one evening. Now when I read that, I thought, you know, here's a guy, he's got everything life could command in his day. He's got prestige, he's got popularity. Um, uh, he's, he's got power, you know, he's at the top of his game. But, but after dark one night, he didn't want anybody to see him because they'd go, wait, 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 wait. Here's the guys that Jesus is talking about and he's fussing them out when he's preaching and teaching. And here's one of them coming to talk to him. He didn't want anybody to see that. So he kind of sneaks around. You ever watch Looney Tunes? So that's, I, that's, I'm sorry, that's the way my mind thinks, y'all. I think Looney Tunes, you know, so, so you got this, you, what's the guy that's the big chicken, what's his name, big rooster? You know how you just kind of, so I could just see him kind of going up to Jesus, yeah, I'm sorry, y'all. I like to make things fun, I'm sorry. After dark one evening, so he comes to Jesus, don't want nobody to see him, and he came to speak with Jesus, it says. And then, and see, he was the consummate politician, rabbi. Well, Jesus wasn't a rabbi. He didn't go to the scholarly schools. He was the son of Mary. He was a carpenter. He was a man, he, he was a man, a rough man. And, and people knew Jesus, but he became a minister. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. So he was putting some mayonnaise on the bread, all right? He's putting some ketchup and mustard and some good chili on that hot dog. Yeah. We all know that God has sent you to teach us your miraculous truth. I'm sorry. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God's with you. So he said, Jesus, we've been watching you. And uh, he said, we, so evidently the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, they all knew about Jesus. And he's the one that had the guts to really go to Jesus. He came by, he came by night. He came in darkness. And you know what I thought about when I thought that? You know, how many people? 
that I've met in my life who, who really want to know God, but they're too proud to admit it. Do you know, you got family members when you go, when you go be with family at Thanksgiving, Christmas, other times of the year, and you're, you know, hanging out with some of your fa- extended family or family or close family, and, and they don't know the Lord. They may never tell you. They put up a facade of pride, a wall of everything's wonderful. And you know, a lot of people do that in life. They put an air. They have an air they carry about them that says, well, I'm doing great. Hope you're doing all right because I'm just, man, I'm doing good. And they're not doing well at all. How many know that's true? There are people that you work with. There are people that are your friends. And some people have a really hard time opening up because of the kinds of social circles that they're in. That's why, how many know, we need to be sensitive to reach out to people. Because the people that you think are the staunchest, uh, staunchest disagreeers may be the ones that are seeking God the most. And there's Nicodemus, you know, he was, he, was, he was the best at his game. But at dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus, Rabbi. We all know God sent you to teach us your miraculous signs or evidence that God's with you. Jesus replied. Now, you know, I think Jesus is just the coolest guy. He could have said anything. instead of, But, 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 but he, he, he skirted right past all of the religious stuff. Because the Pharisees were perfect, you know. And if anybody's going to heaven, a Pharisee's going to heaven. That's what everybody thought. And that's what the Pharisees themselves thought. And that's what Nicodemus probably thought. And then Jesus, Jesus just skirted right past all of the political ideology, uh, ideology of the Sanhedrin. He just cut right to the chase. Jesus replied. He didn't say anything about the accolades the guy gave him. Jesus just said, I tell you the truth. Unless you're born again, born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What? See the kingdom of God. That means you can't go to heaven Unless you're born again. And Nicodemus, because he was a Pharisee, he was trusting that he was doing all the right things, acting all the right ways, fulfilling all those all those hundreds of laws that the Pharisees had added to the Bible. He thought, if anybody's going to heaven, you know I'm going to heaven. And Jesus just burst his bubble with one sentence. He said, I'm going to tell you what. You think you're going to heaven? Nobody's going to heaven unless they're born again. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? So Jesus just threw him just with one sentence. And he didn't know how to respond and he was a bit bewildered. And then Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. Of water and of the Spirit. Now, the jury's out on what really Jesus was saying there. He can say a lot in just one sentence, and it takes you a, a, lot, a, a lot of time to figure out what he's saying. Born of water and of the Spirit. There are, there are those that think that refers to natural birth, water, and then spiritual birth, you know, being born of the Spirit. And then there are others that think that born of water referred to John the Baptist as he, as he uh, had the baptism of repentance, which was preparing the Jews for the time that Jesus would come with truth. So born of water, that means, and they, some people say that refers to the repentance necessary to really give your life to the Son of God. Regardless, born of the water and of the Spirit, Jesus said, Um, No one can go to the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Verse 6, he clarifies humans uh, reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So he says, so don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. So so what Jesus did there was he, he took this out of this religious framework, this works mentality that the Pharisees had. And, and the people on the Sanhedrin had. He took it out of that. A lot of people think they're getting to heaven today based on what they do. And you know, there's a lot of people today who have known Jesus for a long, long time. But they have, they have, they have settled down into a works mentality. God, aren't you proud of me? God, aren't you glad I read my Bible every day? God, aren't you glad that I pray? God, aren't you glad that I go to church? Aren't you glad that I volunteer on the dream team? God, aren't you really, really proud of me? Because when there's a time to volunteer to help our community, I'm right in the middle of it. Aren't you proud of me, God? And you can take that attitude and you know what? you can miss God's best for your life that's where Nicodemus was Jesus saw that that's why he said you got to be born again it's not what you do it's who you know that produces something in you 
that makes the difference. Over the years, you know, I've been in ministry since 1981. I've, I've met a lot of people who have known the Lord for a good long period of time. And, and you know, they come in, they've come in to talk to me over the years in various places I've been in ministry. And, and just, I'll just let people talk a little while because, you know, you, you learn a lot by listening. In fact, James said, be, be, be quick to hear, slow to speak. And then slow to get aggravated with them. So I just listen, you know, and here, there's, I don't know how many times I've thought. Now, I didn't say it right then, but I thought, here's this person. And here's what this person thinks. They've known the Lord for a decade or five years or sometimes 25 or 30 or 40. And they think God should answer their prayer and, and respond to their faith, faith based on their lifestyle and based on what they've been doing. And they're just wrong. I've had people that had a hard time getting healed. But, and you know why? They were expecting God to do something for them based on how they've been living. You don't receive anything from God based on you. We receive from God based on Jesus. How many hear that? So, you know, as you grow in God, you've got to realize, uh, you don't care how good you are. You know what the truth is? I have preached thousands of sermons. I've been to... Uh, dozens of countries. I've had a lot of people saved in my ministry. But when I stand before Jesus, I think about that song. When I get to heaven, just as I am without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me. That old Baptist song I used to sing. And I'm going to hit the dirt. Or if there is dirt, maybe it's gold. Maybe it's gold streets. I'll hit the gold streets and I'll say, thank you for letting me in that door right there. That pearly gate. How many hear me? It's not what you do. It's who you know and what He does to transform your life. And the challenge we all have is the challenge that Nicodemus had. Nicodemus, you know, he was, he was so full of himself. Hello? That, that he thought he earned his way into heaven. And Jesus burst that bubble fairly quickly. He said, so don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The, the wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell when it comes from or where it's going, where it comes from, where it's going. You can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. And, and, and Jesus was basically saying, you see the wind blow, you can, feel, you can feel it on your face. And you can see it, you know, wiggle the leaves on the trees or the bushes in your front yard are moving. Or you forgot to cut your grass for three weeks and your grass is moving. You can see the wind, but you can't tell, you can't tell where it's, you, you, can't, you, you can't see the wind, but the effects are there. And that's the new birth. It, it's in, invisible, but it produces a dynamic change. Born again. So, I mean, he kind of, you know, he, he, uh, he upset Nicodemus enough that Nicodemus had to, had to go home and think a lot. And he set the stage Really for the answers for the problems that we all have in life. Uh, Jesus is the answer, listen to this, to the political problems in America. And Jesus is also the answer to the problems that we have in our personal life and to the spiritual problems we face in the church of the Lord Jesus. How many hear me? Jesus is the answer and he gave it right there. The gospel of Jesus transforms. How many hear me? In fact, when I was studying for this... Uh, just yesterday, I was thinking, well, Friday, I was thinking about Romans 1.16. It says, I'm not ashamed, Paul said, of, of the good news about Christ. It, the good news, is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. How many know there's power in the Word? And if we'll understand that God can take the Word, and, and when you just share it in the context of life, you're not speaking Elizabethan English, you're just talking about life, and you're sharing things that God has done, and you're sharing certain little snippets or portions of the Word. You're sharing the power of God with somebody. The power that can transform somebody. So maybe you, maybe you got somebody at work that acts like the north end of a southbound mule, and you don't like them. And they just, uh, you know, they raise your blood pressure the moment you open the door to the office. Did you know the power of God is in you to minister life to them? And you don't have to quote a scripture verse, but you can talk about, you can talk about how life has changed for you and you can do it in a way that nobody can say, ain't supposed to be sharing your religion at work. You can do it in a way that light shines. Because there's power in the word. How many hear me? The gospel can change liars to honest people. How many hear me? It can change an immoral person to a person that's pure. It can make a lazy person, a person that works really hard. Huh? 
It can make a self-absorbed person a servant of other people. It can change. So you know what that tells me? I don't care who I'm with, where I'm at, what social circle I'm in. It may be on the job. It may be in, in, in my leisure times, you know. I'm out on the trail, you know, hoofing it, riding bikes with people, and we're entering into conversation. I know that the gospel is the power of God to change. And maybe they're saying things, and maybe they're doing things. Or maybe you're at work, and there's some people that are just... Man, they're just a mess where you're working. Like, man, this guy, this, this, this woman needs God so bad. Well, you know what? The gospel is the power of God to change. No individual is impossible with God. How many believe that? You may be here in the room or you may be watching and you say, well, I've messed up my life so bad. I've made a, a series of so many bad decisions on so many levels. And now because I'm so much older, I don't have the opportunities I had before. You always have opportunities with God. You can always change. Don't forget that Moses was 80 years old when he started his ministry. How many hear me? And so regardless of your age, God can do something special and, and amazing in your life. Today, you know, in America, in, in our nation, we're, I, I, you know, I've said it and you feel it. We've never seen a time like this where people are at odds with each other. I mean, honestly, if I can be real with you, it's reached the point that I don't hardly watch the news now. I get my information eclectically. I go here, I go there, I read this article, that article. You know, I absorb, I listen. I'll turn it on every once in a while. But I just don't like the rancor. I don't like the bitterness. I don't like the fussing. How many understand what I'm talking about? And the volume's really high here now. It's like, what is going on with our country? We're so, we're so divided. And when I was a little boy, you heard it constantly. United we stand, divided we fall. Jesus said a house divided against itself can't stand. So you think about the wonderful country of America, the city that's set on a hill, the beacon of light for all of the world. Say, God, we got so, we got so many problems. What are the answers to our problems? Well, what I want to share today is you're part of the answer. You're not part of the problem. You're part of the solution to it. So, so I want to I address something real quickly here because I was reading a book. There's a, a wonderful pastor in uh, New York City. His name is Timothy Keller. Uh, I read, uh, se I've read several of his books. I'm listening to one while I'm riding my bike now. It was awesome. I listened to it Friday. But he's got a book, a, a devotional book I read in the mornings. And uh, he just, some things he says in this book is on the book of Proverbs. So I, was, I read through Proverbs in the morning, and just one little page from Tim Keller. And a couple of weeks ago, he said something that, man, I said, man, that is so good. I, God, you got to give me a time to share this. And here it is. I get to share it. So Proverbs 29, 27 addresses the issues that we even see in American culture right now with the divisiveness and with the rancor or with the, with the elevated, uh, angry way we're speaking to each other. Proverbs 29, 27, New Living Translation says this, the righteous despise the unjust. The wicked despise the godly. How many heard what it just said? Let me read it again. The righteous despise the unjust. The wicked despise the godly. There's a political divide. And this scripture right here correctly defines what's happening in America right now. Those who believe there are moral absolutes, they don't like the ones who feel like there are no absolutes and truth is relative. How many know there's a large portion of our culture today? And let me say, if you have young people in, in, uh, in school, particularly college, universities, they're taught that there are no moral absolutes. There is no definitive right or wrong. It's what you want it to be, and it's a situational thing according to where you are. At There's one point it might be right to lie, but this other situation, it's not right to lie. Or that might be moral for you, but that's not moral for me. How many know that's enmeshed in American culture right now? If you don't know that, then your head's in the sand or you don't leave out your front door very often because I'm telling you, we're enmeshed in, in some big challenges today. So we have on one side those that believe there are no, there is no right or wrong. I do what I want to do, when I want to do, with whom I want to do it, as long as I want to do it. And you know what? You need to leave me alone and not judge me. How many hear me? And then there's on the other extreme, here's these other people. We know what's right. We know we're doing right. We know we're thinking right. We know we're living right. And you is wrong, wrong, wrong. And they're fussing. 
right? And both of them are wrong. Huh? The righteous despise the unjust, the wicked despise the godly. Well, here's the deal. Why is that? Why is this happening in America right now? It's because we've lost a moral standard. We've lost a moral foundation. When you lose a, a moral foundation for living in a culture, a moral foundation so that everybody can ascribe to it and say, this is right, this is not right. We should do this, we should not do this. When you lose that, then you lose the ability to come together in a common way and have some civil discussion. How many hear me? Used to be you could disagree with somebody, and if they disagree with you, you sit in the chair, you drink a cup of coffee, and you talk now you give them a spit bath and why is that because we've lost a foundation of ethics that can bring us together and let me just say without God intervening in America there is no hope for our nation it, this will get worse it'll turn into into a uh, a, a, a anger to the point that it'll be out on the streets. We could have riots. We could have insurrections in some of the larger cities. How many hear me? I mean, what we're dealing with right now is really, really serious. It's in the formative stages. But get to, it could easily and quickly erupt. How many hear me? And, you know, that creates silence when I say it. But we need to deeply think about what's happening in our country. And then your next thought may be, well... What can anybody do about it? You can do a lot about it. Before I get there, listen to this. I've got some quotes. Uh, here's one is a, a Bible scholar I read after that I just really love. He's from England. His name is William Barclay. And he said this, In Christianity, the individual comes before the system. It's true that they say without Christianity, there could be no such thing as democracy because Christianity alone guarantees and defends the value of the ordinary individual man or woman. God ascribes value to that little baby that's about to be aborted. God ascribes value to that older person whose life is spent and they're ill, but you still should do every single thing you can to keep them alive. How many hear me? God has got, there's ethics when you, when you talk about, when you talk about God loving a human life. He goes on to say, say it's true to say that without Christianity, there could be no such thing as democracy. Listen to this. Because Christianity alone guarantees and defends the value of the ordinary individual man or woman. If ever, listen, if ever Christian principles are banished, from political and economic life. There is nothing left to keep at bay the totalitarian state ruled by force where individuals are lost in the system and exist not for their own sake, but only for the sake of that system. That might have just went over your head, but you know what he just said? What he just said, without godly values, without a, a system of ethics, uh, people become so unruly that they have to be ruled by force. And that's where our country is headed right now. How many hear what I'm saying? Listen to this. Is, uh, this is the 28th president of the United States. He was president from 1913 to 1921. His name is Woodrow Wilson. He said there are a good many problems before the American people. And he said that way back then. I'm thinking, man, he should be living today, you know. A uh, lot, good many problems before the American people today and before me as president, but I expect to find the solution of those problems just in the proportion that I'm faithful in the study of the Word of God. That's pretty cool from a president, would you say? Daniel Webster said, if we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and to prosper. But if we and our posterity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us and bury our glory in profound obscurity. Living as we do in a democratic, pluralistic society. A pluralistic society is a society where people come from a bunch of different nations and they have belief systems that come with them. So there's not one clear belief system for everybody. And that's what's happening in America right now. People are, immigrants are coming. It's great to have immigrants, but everybody's coming in with their own belief system. And the challenge is if we don't have some kind of a moral compass to point us in the right direction, we can't succeed as a nation. And that's what these people are saying. He said, living as we do in the Democrat, 
democratic, pluralistic society, we can't expect the government to make the Bible its official guidebook, but it would help if the professed Christians and Christian churches would major on preaching, teaching, and obeying the Word. So what are you saying? You can make a difference. How many know our church can make a difference in our community? You can make a difference in your community. You can make a difference where you work. It's up to the individual to make a difference. Lastly, I got one more quote. John Adams, this is 1798. He addressed the military. And this is often quoted, but it's worth listening to again. We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passion that is unbridled or unrestrained by morality and religion. Avarice, which is greed, ambition, revenge, or gallantry, which is selfish bravery or selfish courage just for yourself. It would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. And lastly, he said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So without a moral compass, without morals, without defined standards, no culture can exist very long. It was said well, way back in Jesus' time, uh, all roads lead to Rome. Rome was the ruler of the world in that day in the Middle East. And uh, it was a huge empire that lasted hundreds of years. But if you read history, the thing that toppled Rome was not some marauding army that came from without. It was their moral corruption from within that was Rome's demise. And that's where we're headed as a nation today. All of us feel the angst. All of us feel this. And if you're like me, I've lived here long enough that I have a great love for a America, do you? I mean, it's still, to me, the land of the free and the home of the brave. And, you know, you want people to come and, and have a place where they can meet the Lord and enjoy life and believe God and, and raise their children and do what's right. But the only hope for America today is the Lord Jesus and what He said to Nicodemus. How many hear what I'm saying? Because why, why is it? Well, when you come to Jesus, the Bible, and spiritual things, Jesus does Two things. The Bible does two things. Number one, it gives a standard or a code of conduct can, that can be a foundation for a culture. How many hear me? And the second thing the character does is it produces, or the gospel does, it produces a character change when it's believed. So this is the only thing in the world that can change a per person from darkness to life and that can take the division out of a division-torn nation. How many hear me? And I was thinking about this, where we are right now in America, it's probably stated the best. The book of Judges has seven cycles of sin, which brought, certain, brought, them, uh, brought them a lot of hell, and then they had to be delivered over and over and over again. But the book of Judges, the very last uh, um, verse of the book of Judges is Judges 21, 25. This is New Living Translation. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And that's where we are in America today. Is that true? People say, leave me alone. Oh, they don't. They say, leave me alone. Leave me alone and let me do what I want to do. I'm not bothering you and you're not bothering me. Just let me, let me be me and you be you and you don't put your stuff on me. I won't put my stuff on you. Well, that's all good. But you know what? You know what? We're, sink we're a sinking ship. And if we as believers sit by and do nothing, we're not helping. How many hear me? Well, I mean, I'm just one person. No, no, no. No, no. God placed something in you. If you're a born-again child of God, there's something in you that is the solution to the problems that you face in your personal life, in your marriage, in your children, in your family, in your community, and in our nation. And it's called light. How many hear me? So I want to talk, can we talk about that a little bit? So we started out talking to Nicodemus, uh, talking to Jesus, and Jesus talking to him about the new birth. The new birth produces light. How many hear me? And all through the New Testament, there are two metaphors that are mentioned quite frequently. One is darkness and the other is light. And they're in juxtaposition to one another. And they're almost opposites of one another. Light produces, when I think about light, so I like to make things really practical for me. That's just the way my mind works. What is the Bible talking about when it talks about light? 
And what is the Bible talking about when it talks about darkness? We have light in America and we have darkness in America. How many know God's called you to be a light? What, does, what represents that light? Well, when I think about the light, where does the light come from? It comes from God. How does God come to us in the person of the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit produce in us when we come to know Jesus as Lord? Well, Galatians 5, and 23. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control, and then the Apostle Paul, there's no law. It said there's no law against that. Those are things that everybody wants to emulate. Yes or no? If you know Jesus, that's inside you. Does our culture need it now? Do we need love and joy and peace? Except, yes, we do. Do we need self-control? Who can show that? Me and you can well, what does darkness produce? You got light, you got darkness. What does darkness produce? Again, the Apostle Paul. I couldn't find it summarized any better than in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, Quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like that. Do you see any of that stuff going on today? Everywhere. So you got to ask yourself, is there a lot of darkness? Yes. But is there light in the middle of the darkness? Yes. How many got some light in you? Please raise your hand. Hey, ho. Whoa. In fact, will you, if you, do you have a phone? How about get your phone out? I want you to get your phone out and cut the flashlight on. Come on, cut your flashlight. Everybody, hold it up. Hold it up. If you got a phone, you have my permission. Take it out. Turn on the flashlight. Parents, let your kids too. Look at all the lights in here. Does that make a difference? Does that make a difference? Oh my goodness, y'all. You say, well, I'm just one. But all of us are just one. But if all of us start doing what Jesus wants us to do, we can make a difference. Light. Let's talk a little bit about light. So this is the day for us to boldly share the light that's in us. And just be aware of this when this happens. You're going to have two different kinds of responses when you are the light that Jesus wants you to be. Some will ask you questions. And they'll, they'll want more. And then others will become defensive and angry because they like what they're doing. They're not about to change what they're doing. They're stubborn in what they're doing and they want you to leave them alone. And then, and then you've got to be willing to accept that. How many hear me? And I read this in, in, a, uh, uh, in a book many decades ago where the author said this, the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. Do you hear that? The same rays of the sun that melts wax. You got a piece of clay beside it, it gets harder, and, and you can't manipulate it. Right? And that's the way human personality is. When God deals with some people, they just bow up and get more stubborn. We ain't gonna change. Leave me alone. God deals with another person, and they melt. God, you're talking to me. God, I need to change. How many want to be the wax and not the clay right so you just got to be aware of this so real quickly as we close real quick five things to know about light god has called every one of us to be light here are five things we need to know about it number one jesus brought light into the world and the light that jesus brings into the into the world he wants it to challenge the culture that we live in. John chapter 1, in the beginning the Word existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created and His life brought what? Light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. John 1, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself wasn't the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, 
who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And that's Jesus. Jesus said, John 9, 5, While I'm here in the world, I'm the light of the world. First John, John said this in his epistle, This is the message we've heard from Jesus and declare to you. God is light. John chapter 12, Jesus replied, My light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can so darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness can't see where they're going. Put your trust in the light while there's still time. Then you will become children of light. The apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe they're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. Uh, They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we can see the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts. He says it over and over again. God is light. Jesus is the light of the world. And he's placed that light inside of you and me. And it's a whole lot brighter than the light on your phone. How many would agree? Number two, Jesus' light delivers us from spiritual darkness. Just one verse. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. How many are glad that God has rescued you from the life that you live? You may be involved in things right now. I want you to know selfishness, greed, anger, addictions to drugs, addiction to sex, addiction to alcohol, pornography. Some people are addicted to entertainment in all kinds of ways. All of those are byproducts, friends, of walking in darkness. And if you're bound by anything, how many to know the light in Jesus can set you free but people just simply need to know about it and they're not going to know about it unless somebody tells them and we tell people two ways we tell them with our lifestyle and how we live how we respond when the boss says this or does that or when the company does this or when somebody pulls out in front of you and almost causes a wreck and other people see you smiling instead of giving them the thing you know what I'm saying yeah The light shines inside of you. Number three, we affect people the way light affects darkness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said, you are. Who is? Who's he talking about? Us. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So the work that we do, honoring God with your work ethic, honoring God by loving your spouse, by loving your husband, loving your wife, honoring God by disciplining your children, spending time with your children, honoring God by keeping up your house, trimming your bushes, cutting your grass, honoring God by doing what you're supposed to do, honoring God by let, by smiling at somebody who cuts in the place in front of you at the grocery store when you're too busy. How many know that's letting your light shine? How many know we're called to let our light shine? And you may not think you're making a difference, but every time you honor God and say no to the natural desires you have to get back, get even, say something, to get involved in gossip on your job, how many know you're letting your light shine when you resist those things? Hello? You're also letting your light shine when you go to somebody and say, you know, I just messed up real bad. I just fussed so-and-so out in the office two doors down, and everybody in the hallway heard it, and I'm going to every office. I was wrong. I sinned against my God, and I was wrong, and I asked forgiveness. How many know that's also letting your light shine? Because you're human, and people see your mistakes. They know you're wrong, but sometimes it's really great in front of others to admit we are. How many hear me? Um, Peter said this, instead you must worship, 1 Peter three fifteen. you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. Ask if, uh, and if someone asks you about the hope, Your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. And then lastly, Ephesians 5. I'll let you read that. I don't have time. Number four, 
You look at my notes there on version. Darkness naturally runs from light, and light is number four. How many know when, when, uh, when light shows up, there's some bugs that run to light and other bugs that run away? See, my, my mind goes back to my time in Africa. We've got 12 churches under our church name there. And some of the places I go have no running water or electricity. And so you got this little, uh, you got your own little light that you bring. You know, I got all kind of little funny lights to take with me because there's not natural light. And when I turn the light, it's kind of scary. You turn the light off and you hear those little crinkling things around. They're critters. I call them critters. They're all over the walls. They're on the ceiling. They're on the floor. And I'm under my covers. I've got, I, I wrap myself up in the bag. It's like, you ain't getting in my bag. But when I turn the light on, they run. How many hear me? When I turn the light on, they, want to, they don't want to be seen because I'm going to squish them. Listen to what Jesus said, John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His only one and only Son, that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him, but anyone who does not believe in Him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world. Listen to this. But people love the darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil, listen, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. They're afraid. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see uh, that they are doing what God wants. So people are afraid. A lot of people are afraid of me. As a, you know, if I'm on a plane or I'm somewhere and I'm talking to somebody I don't know, the moment I say I'm pa- say, what do you do for a living? I'm a, pa- a pastor. Immediately they change. And sometimes I've had people absolutely not say another word to me. I've had that happen a lot. They cut me right off. You know why? Darkness doesn't like light. And that's persecution. And, and we're susceptible to that. We're, and that will happen. They're good, that's going to happen. There are others who change the subject or act like they're Mr. and Ms. Goody Two-Shoes, you know. And they tell me about all their philanthropic effort, efforts and good works. Well, God doesn't want to hear about that. He just wants you to come to Jesus and be born again. How many hear me? Bottom line is there's criticism that comes because people won't like the light that is inside of you. And you know what? Us as believers, we got, we got to man up. I mean, seriously. Listen to what Jesus said just about to close. Matthew 5, 10, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you, persecute you, lie about you, and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. Remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. If you let your light shine, some people are not going to like it, and you've got to be willing to accept that. How many hear me? Lastly, question. Or am I willing? Are you willing to be a light? Being a light means I'm going to walk with God I'm going to do His will. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be fair. I'm going to be honest. Regardless of what that may cost me, I'm going to let my light shine in every situation I come to. And when I do wrong, I'm going to be upfront about it. I'm going to confess it to others and to the Lord. And I want to live an honorable life because I want light to shine from my life. Are you willing to be a light? When you say that, the next question, are you willing to be subjected to criticism by others? And are you willing for others to turn their turn their, their face away from you, turn themselves away and not fellowship with you, not invite you to the office parties, not do other things with you because you are a believer. That's that goes right with the territory of being a light. Yes or no? Lastly, as I conclude, Isaiah 60 says this, uh, Arise, shine, your light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. This is talking about before Jesus comes back. And His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. How many want to be a light? Let me ask it a different. How many want to help be an answer to the problems in our culture? How many really want to be a light? 
How many are willing to pay, pay the price? There's a cost, and it may cost friendships. It may cost people that say things that you don't appreciate, and you can't, you can't give them a spit bath back. You've got to love them. How many are willing to go there? Everybody stand up on your feet.